Those are, that are here, I see one new face, so thank you for coming to our record keeping for business startup. Um, this is our sixth week in the Money Start program, and um, Amy Fisher is a small business consultant, and she will be um, presenting the class tonight. If you guys have any questions, feel free to raise your hands and, or just speak up, and she'll answer them. Okay, um, so we had, I think, 14 people registered for tonight, so we're going to go ahead and get started, and then if we have some late um, latecomers, then we'll just let them kind of mosey on in. So record keeping, there's a variety of ways that you can keep records. I have a, um, a couple little bonus handouts for you guys here on some additional record keeping options, but... Um, Basically, the agenda is kind of like the same as the rest of the events that we've had. We're going to kind of go through some examples. We're going to talk about the different options that are available. Um, as always, if you have any questions or if you have a way that you're doing it that's better, that you want to share, um, it's definitely an open forum. So feel free to uh, contribute any information that you have that you feel is going to be relevant to the group. And I think, has everybody attended one of the sessions before? Um, no. 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 Okay, do we want to just go around the room and maybe introduce ourselves so we're all kind of familiar with each other? I'm Amy Fisher, and I work here as a small business consultant at the SBDC. My name is Terry Bono. I'm a small business owner. I own a, a warehouse, I guess. Okay. Because I don't have anything in it yet. <laughs> Basically. <laughs> so you're looking to fill a warehouse. <laughs> yeah, I have a commercial property I bought, and okay. I, haven't, I haven't decided what I'm going to put in yet. Um, I'm Doug Maxson. I just opened up um, a mobile barbecue trailer. You look different without your beard. I know. <laughs> I know. I'm like, that's Doug? <laughs> <laughs> My son said I don't look like his dad anymore. Yeah, so yeah. It was down to here last week. So. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so we opened up just in time to winterize our trailer and store it for the winter. So. <laughs> Perfect timing. Yeah. Travis Storm, uh, just getting ready to uh, start a business, thinking about uh, uh, e-commerce business. Oh, okay. So. Carly Norvon, I'm starting a, an escape room here in Mount Pleasant. Oh, right. um, trying to kick that off at the beginning of the year. I'm Jasmine. I'm just thinking about to start a small business and trying to learn as much as possible here. Hi, my name is Bruce Mackinnon. We have a small business that's called the Business Trade Exchange. We're a network of business owners that use an organized form of barter. Oh, very cool. Oh, cool. Mm -hmm. My name is Jane, and I am considering a business um, with senior services. Oh, okay. For senior services. So we have quite a variety of, of different business opportunities, but one thing is always the same with whatever type of business that you have, and that is you have to make sure that you keep good records. Keeping good records is not only going to help you operate your business more efficiently, it's going to help you when you go to file your taxes, it's going to help you with a lot of different things that are going to be very important as your business grows and scales. Um, so we're going to talk about the objectives Today. So we're going to talk about the concept of record keeping and why it is important to your, your business. We're going to talk about some record keeping practices and some tools that are available. And those tools can be either paper or electronic. And we'll explore a couple of different options with that. Uh, talking about record keeping practices, some rules and some tools and how they work. Uh, there are a lot of benefits that a small business has from record keep, for record keeping. We're going to talk about some reasons to do that and some of the records that you should keep. Uh, kind of a little bit of a basic information about um, IRS guidelines as far as record keeping, because that's who we're trying to kind of keep happy. We want to track our customers and our financials, but we also want to make sure that we keep the IRS happy. And we're going to talk a little bit about some software products that are available for record keeping. So does anybody have any specific questions that they have about record keeping or any tips or anything that they would like to share? No pressure, but sometimes we have um, something that like you're looking to learn. So I want to learn how to 
uh, do electronic banking or I want to learn how to share files virtually. So we'll talk about all of that. If there's something that comes to mind as we're kind of going through this, just let me know and we can stop at any time. Okay, so record keeping is important and it doesn't matter whether you're a sole proprietorship or a partnership or a corporation. There's a certain element of record keeping that is important for every type of, of business. And a lot of times the success of your business relies on effective record keeping. So think about tracking your customers. Think about, normally when you think about record keeping, you think about revenues and expenses. So at least that's what I think about because I'm a financial person. But um, making sure that, that you're making enough money to make ends meet. But it's also important to track who your customers are, how you get in touch with them. If you're in the restaurant field, you know, thinking about tracking your inventory, things like that. And record keeping can be a variety of things. So I had clients, I brought some samples here. I had a client one time and he was a food truck and we were doing financial, what did I do there? It's just jumping around. Okay, all right, I'm gonna put that down. <laughs> so I had a client that had a food truck and we were working on his financials. And I said, well, bring in your financial information, we'll do some projections. He brought me an entire box of these that had all of the receipts for all of his food and receipts from his deposit for his bank. And he probably had, I don't know, this is, he was in business for a while, so he probably had 40 or so of these. So I had to go through, and I probably could have made him do this, but I didn't go through and add it all up, and what's the cost of goods sold, and I'm writing all this stuff on his envelope. I'm like, the next time you bring me an envelope, it better look like this. But it's okay to keep track of your records like this. So if you're operating a food truck, this could be for a catering event, and you can put all your receipts and a copy of your deposit slip in here, and you can use this. That's totally fine. If you are, uh, a more active business, say you're a restaurant or maybe some type of a service industry where you have a lot of different things going on, it might not be a good idea to track using the manila or the folder envelope because you're not tracking by event. It's gonna be kind of like a rolling number. So that might not be a good idea to do it that way. The main thing is to keep things in order. You can also use manila folders. I brought props tonight. So a lot of people use these hanging folders and, and this works really, really well. I used this uh, before I went electronic with all of my files and I would have a folder every month and I would have a list of all my expenses on a piece of paper and I would have that stapled on the inside. So as I would pay my electric bill or my house payment or my insurance payment, I would write that on there and then I would put the bill in here and then this would be like the month of November. So I would always have that information together. So record keeping is important not only for your business but for your personal as well. Because if you are applying for a loan or something like that for your business, you're gonna have to have good record keeping for your personal stuff as well. So you can use a lot of different uh, things Manila folders. You can use an online electronic filing system. So I don't know if any of you have met Tony. Tony has no paper in his life at all. He scans everything. Like he even he has a scanner in his garage, and he'll go through his mail and he puts it through the scanner and then he shreds it. So he has no paper at all. Now I'm not one to go to that extreme, but some people really like everything digital. So it, it could range from putting everything in a little envelope to you know, storing everything electronically. You have to do what's gonna work for you. And it's gonna have to be an easy system that doesn't have a lot of barriers, otherwise you're not gonna do it. You know, throwing it in a shoebox and doing it once a month is gonna be really cumbersome. So day-to-day -day operations is gonna be really important. And it's gonna be important too for fast retrieval of records. So if you want to know, okay, last year when I catered that you know, pig gig event, how much food did I have to buy? So you can pull this out and you can look, okay, I bought this and I bought this and I sold 600 meals, so they're anticipating it's going to be an increased attendance this year, so I'm going to have to ramp up my food a little bit. 
So you could pull out this information, or if you have it on an Excel spreadsheet, you could look at that information as well. You can also use it to track the profitability um, and updating it on an ongoing basis, so tracking the cash flow um, up, and, up and down, ideally up. Um, and like I said, it's good to keep, it's important to keep good records, both business and personal. Getting in the habit of keeping everything in a certain order is definitely going to be important for you going forward. So why is record keeping important? So it's important for your business operations to track details of your business. So that could be inventory if you're a retail operation. It could be sales if you're a service organization. It could be a variety of things. And that's also going to allow you to plan for the future. It's important, too, for legal items, so contracts. So if you're signing a lease for a space, you want to make sure you keep that copy of that contract. If you're working in the food industry, you have licenses and permits, you're going to have tons and tons of licenses and permit paperwork that you're going to have to have. Payroll and personnel is really important, too. There are certain documents that you have to have for every employee that, that you hire and certain records. And then federal, state, and local information on the taxes. So we're going to talk about each one of those in a little bit more detail. <coughs> so we're talking about business operations. So when they're talking about business operations, what you track, so customer records. So I'm thinking about um, something that I've ordered online. And when I order something online, I put in my email address and they update me on the shipping and everything. But then they also, like I ordered this bag through eBags. So every day, eBags sends me an email. Buy this, buy this, here's a coupon, here's a coupon. So they have my information as a customer in their records and they are constantly, constantly promoting to me, constantly. So that's really important to have that information retained so you can continue to go back to those customers and ideally get repeat customers. So do you collect any information from the people that come to your food truck? Um, for like catering and special things, mm -hmm. I put everybody's stuff in a square. Oh, okay. So I, I just basically just name, address, phone number, and mm -hmm. email. Yeah. That's, that's good information to have, though, definitely. So then you can check back with them if it's just a one-time event or maybe if you're trying to kind of fill your calendar and you know that they usually have some events in the summer, you know, hey, you want to get on the calendar now, I'll give you a $50 discount. So keeping the customer information is really, really important. Um, looking at the sales and sales records to see who bought what. Um, we used to be members of the Dollar Shave Club. I don't know if anybody's heard of the Dollar Shave Club. So you buy the, the razor part and then you buy the blades. Well, they automatically ship me blades every other month. I don't necessarily need blades every other month, but they send me a reminder, hey, we're shipping this to you. Do you want it? And then I have to tell them yes or no. So, but they keep track of what I order and then they try and upsell me stuff. So last time they sent me some stuff, they sent me a sample of like beard balm or something like that. And nobody in my family has a beard, but they're trying to upsell and sell me things that I typically have not bought. Um, correspondence, so if you're thinking about the escape room. Mm -hmm. So if you have someone that goes through the escape room, do you want to find out what they think about it? So maybe you could collect their email information and then send them a survey after. You know, thanks for attending the escape room in Mount Pleasant on, you know, December 2nd. We'd like to get some feedback from you. And if you complete the survey, you'll be entered into our monthly drawing for a free group of five to attend the escape room. And then think about the things that you want to ask them. So, did you enjoy X? Or did you enjoy Y? Or do you have any suggestions in the future? Do you think, uh, would you do a if I did a horror-themed room, or I don't know, I'm trying to think escape room stuff, and I don't really know because I've never been to one. But communication, you know, back and forth. So, hey, you use my product or service. What did you think about it? And you can use that for customer discovery to see if there's any other opportunities available. And inventory. If you're in the food industry, you know, you got to keep track of your inventory. you got to make sure that you have enough of what you are uh, going to produce on hand. 
You can also look back, I'm thinking to when I used to work at McDonald's, and this was way back in, God, it was probably in the 80s, 90s maybe, and all of the schedules were still on paper, but they had the historical information from the year before, so they knew how many hamburgers they sold, how many people came in, how many of whatever they sold, so they would know kind of what the projection was for that day. So they would know that, you know, maybe they had to pull an extra bag of fries because typically on the second Saturday of July, there's a lot of people coming through for whatever. But following that information and keeping track of that is going to allow you to uh, keep your inventory steady. So thinking about in the retail operations, so you're probably, if you're buying bathing suits, you're probably not going to be buying bathing suits. If you're the retailer, you're not going to be buying them in June because you're going to want them on your shelves in June. You're probably going to be ordering them in December. So looking at your records from when you bought bathing suits last year, how many did you buy? How many did you sell? How many did you have to clearance out? So looking at your historical records on your inventory is going to help as well. Um, so looking at your record keeping, so identify the detail records that you already keep. So you got to start with what it is that you have right now. And then figure out the, um, well detail is like the specific information. So that would be customer sales, inventory. Planning records is going to be more of like the McDonald's example. So I need to figure out how much I need to buy. I need to figure out how many people are going to come in. I need to figure out that information so I can have everything ready. Um, identify the legal records that you are keeping right now or that you need to keep. So copies of licenses and permits, um, contracts with your landlord. If you have uh, workers, you want to keep uh, track of that identifying information. Um, and tax records. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the tax records. So the IRS has a great uh, piece of information, um, starting a business and keeping records. So this tells all about all the information that you as a business owner need to keep. It talks about um, getting your employer identification number. So um, if everybody probably, if you're in business right now, you probably already have that. If you don't, that's going to tell you how to do that. It talks about income taxes, employment taxes, um, how, how you deduct business expenses, looking at depreciation, and then there's a segment in there specifically on record keeping, so how much you need to save and for how long. So this is going to be a good piece of information to help you understand what you need to track and why you need to track it. So. So think about your record keeping. Are there things that you don't need to keep? Are there things that you need to keep? I know a lot of people keep everything because they don't want to miss any specific piece of information. Um, looking at records that need to be added. So maybe you need to track um, like attendance or attendance at an event or people in your warehouse. So what is it that you need to track and why? And then are there areas that you think you're lacking on? Do you wish you kept better track of some information? So thinking about that going forward. So this is kind of an example of how long you need to keep information. Um, and it's in years. So when you're looking at employees and personnel inventory, you don't necessarily need to keep that stuff that long. So two to three years. Contracts, it says four years, but I would keep copies of contracts for longer than that because you never know when you might have an issue that might, might go back more than four years. So definitely keep all of those. Insurance records, checks and payables, invoices and receivables, they say five years on there, five to seven years is typically standard for that. Uh, payroll information, so money going out to your employees, six years. 
And then looking at these things. These you should keep historically forever. A lot of the retirement plan information, you can get that electronically now, so you don't necessarily have to save that information. But any annual statements or any auditor's reports that you have, you definitely need to keep those a little bit longer. Question, does the IRS go back as far as seven years on audits? The IRS typically does go back seven years on audits, and that's why I say some of those pieces of information you probably need to keep a little bit longer, especially invoices and receivables, checks and payables. Um, the organization that put this together is the SBA. So these are SBA suggested guidelines. But ultimately, seven years is kind of IRS rule of thumb. And it depends on the type of business too that you have. If you're a business that is typically a high cash business, the IRS is typically going to have their eye on you a little bit more than a business that is not so cash intense. So I'm thinking, you know, bars, restaurants, things like that. They track that a little bit tighter, I think, just because there is the tendency to have money going places where it, it typically should not go. But, you know, that would probably be a conversation you would want to have either with your accountant or with your attorney to see what their recommendation is. This is SBA guidelines. IRS guidelines say seven years. Um, I think IRS probably trumps the SBA, but I don't know, I wouldn't want either one of them on my bad side, if you know what I mean. <laughs> so, you know, one thing that we didn't talk about, and I must have deleted this slide, um, a little bit about employee information. So they touched on it just a little bit um, in here about payroll, time cards, personnel files. When you're thinking about information on employees, there's some things that you should keep not only um, to protect you, well, I guess to protect you from being sued. Um, when you're hiring someone, there's a kind of a standard checklist that you should use to make sure that you have all of the documentation in place. And then, a lot of companies don't do this, but performance appraisals on your employees. So this is gonna protect you from being sued from you know, a wrongful termination or something one like that. One more, okay. Mm -hmm. Didn't mean to show it yet, but. So, and all of this information is readily available through the SBA or the SBDC, we actually have a human resource consultant that works on our staff. And if you have specific human resource questions, we do have some resources for you that can kind of help you with that information. So this is not an all-inclusive list. These are just suggestions if you're hiring people, the things that you should kind of keep in mind. So record-keeping tools. So we talked a little bit about the different types of tools that you can keep. Um, it talks about simple paper tools. So I mean that would probably go back with the example with my guy with the envelope. So he kept everything on paper. Now he writes the stuff on the outside because he finds that much more helpful. But he's never going to have an Excel spreadsheet. That's just not his gig. And that's totally okay. You have to use whatever is going to be the best for you. <coughs> um, tickler system. So that would be if you know that you have to pay your taxes every quarter. So you probably want to have some type of file identifying the information that you're going to have to have ready when you're paying your taxes. Or the tickler system could be the same thing that I had for my personal stuff. So I had all the list of the bills that I had to pay on one side and then I put all of the stuff in the file folder on the other side. So that could be an option too. Um, computer systems, that's kind of a generic category that they have in there, but when they're talking about computer systems, they're just talking about automated records. So it would be some type of an automated, automated customer management system. So Square would be a good option. Uh, some of the other options are maybe HubSpot, 
or Salesforce. So some way to keep track of your clients. It depends on how many clients you have. It depends on the type of business, the, the type of, of systems that you keep. Um, there's other options too when we're talk of, talking about the cloud. Everybody's kind of heard of, has everybody heard of the cloud? It's basically your stuff is virtually uploaded to this magic space in the sky and then you can pull it from your computer. You can pull it from your iPad or you can pull it from your iPhone. It's stored there to be accessible anywhere you are by any device that you have. And a lot of people use that for their accounting systems. So most of the clients that I work with typically use some type of a QuickBooks program that seems to be the most popular and the least expensive. That doesn't mean that that is necessarily the product for everyone. Um, I have a lot of clients that also use Square and use Square for keeping all of their accounting system. The main thing is that it's just, it has to work for you. So file hosting, that would be the same thing as in, in the cloud. So if you have specific documents that you use for your, your clients, keeping them up in the cloud. So they're gonna go into a little bit more detail. So the paper tools. How many of you that are in business right now keep track of everything in paper? Yeah, and that's, I mean, that's totally okay because it's always there, it's always accessible. The important thing with paper is that um, it might get lost, it could get misplaced, but then if you store something digitally, it could get misplaced too. But keeping it in a good order, whether it be, you know, the envelope or file folders, hanging folders, the main thing with record keeping and storage is all about organization. Whatever system you have, it needs to be organized and it has to be simple enough so you can use it over and over and over. Um, so we talked about this tickler system and thinking about the things, we touched a little bit on the quarterly taxes, but things that you have to do repetitively. So, and they kind of have a little sample there. So having a folder for specifically your tax information and knowing when you have to access that. License renewals, so you definitely don't want your license to lapse with the health department because they'll come and they'll shut you down. So making sure that you have all that information. License renewals could be vehicle renewals too. So if you have a fleet of vehicles, if you have a delivery company, a courier service, uh, food truck, um, things like that, so making sure that that is all reviewed and updated. Insurance reviews and renewals are also very important, especially as your business grows. So when you're first starting out, you, you have to get an insurance policy because the bank says you have to get an insurance policy or your business consultant says you have to get an insurance policy to protect your interest. So it could be you're putting a lot of money into the building that you're leasing and you want to make sure that if there is a fire that you get the money back out of that. It could be in the example of the escape room. So if you have an escape room set up and you have someone in there and they trip and fall and they are injured and they sue you, mm -hmm. you want to make sure that you have the correct insurance in place to protect you. So as your business grows, different things change. So when you first started out, you were a mom and pop restaurant, you were just really small, didn't really have any employees, didn't really have any money invested, and then all of a sudden things took off. So making sure that you meet with your insurance agent to kind of talk about those things. So as you hire employees, getting workers' compensation insurance, that's a really important piece. If you're buying new equipment, you wanna make sure that you have that added onto your insurance policy. If you have a restaurant and all of a sudden you decide, oh, I'm gonna hire teenage kids to deliver my food, that's another added risk on there. So having a conversation with your insurance agent when you make changes like that, or at least on an annual basis to make sure that you have everything up to date and that you're properly insured. My background is insurance and risk management, so I could talk forever on that, but that's really boring. Um, upcoming bills, so that's back to my example of that file folder. So you want to make sure that you have all of your bills paid on time because that's going to affect your credit score and you want to make sure that you keep your credit score. Did we talk about credit score yet? Mm -hmm. Okay, credit score is next week, so I'm not really going to touch on that all that much. But credit score is very, very important. 
if you want to get some type of an extended line of credit if you are going to uh, grow your business. So callback. So you probably have people calling you, hey, I want to book for you know next summer. I've got an event on blah 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 blah. Keeping some type of a methodical system on um, that information so you can make sure you know you're not writing it in a sticky note and put it in, in your wallet and then two months later you call that person back and they've already booked someone. So thinking about that, that could be for food truck, that could be for you know a, a to-do list that you have to do. It could be for, say you're in the lawn care business and you have people that are calling you wanting you to come and do service on, on their lawn or maybe do a yard cleanup or something. So callbacks, you definitely want to keep track of that information. So computer systems, we talked about that in a little bit of detail, but computer systems could be in addition to paper tools, or it could be like my boss, Tony, and it could be all computer and no paper at all. Um, computer systems take up less space, obviously. You don't have to have the big filing cabinet with all the paper and and collect a lot of stuff. Um, it's faster and easier if you have to collect all of your records. Instead of going through here and adding up all of your receipts and figuring out, okay, I sold $7,000 worth of food and my cost for the event was $250 for the permit and I spent $700 on meat and other products. So you could do that, but it's gonna be a lot faster and a lot easier if you track all of that information online. And I'm not too sure why they say on there many businesses and government agencies allow use of the internet. I don't know quite what they mean by that. But I do know that you have the ability to, to file information now and pay your taxes and do things like that electronically. That has not always been the case. Now, um, I don't know how many of you have filed your your LLC, if that's the direction that you're going. But on October 30th, Lara changed their whole system. So now you can file everything electronically. They say it's easier. Um, I haven't had any feedback on whether or not it's easier than the old process, but there is a lot of different opportunities becoming available because of the increased use of the internet. And you, know, you can grow into a computer system over time. Ideally, that's the way that things are trending, but if you are just not comfortable with computers and technology, don't force yourself to do something that you're not gonna be comfortable doing because it just, it won't, won't work. And if you are doing something on a computer, make sure that you back up your files daily because there's nothing worse than putting all of that information into something and then having that information lost. So that's definitely something that's important. Okay, so cloud computing. So using the internet to store, manage, and process data on your computer. So that could be a variety of things. And typically when you think cloud computing, um, it has to do with accounting, so record keep, bookkeeping type of things, um, and then file hosting or, or storing your information. So when you're talking about cloud computing related to accounting, so Let's use a QuickBooks example. So QuickBooks right now, you can purchase QuickBooks in a variety of different ways. So you can go to Office Max or go online, you can download the QuickBooks program on your you know, desktop or your laptop, and then you can keep all of your records on there. QuickBooks also has an online option as well, so you could do it virtually, if you will. So you would enter all of your information on through the internet, and then you could access that anywhere that would allow you to you know print out all the reports and, and do all that stuff and, and do that all anywhere you know from your phone from your desktop uh, typically if you're using cloud-based software there's no need to do upgrades so if you buy the QuickBooks program and you download it on your computer after a while it's going to be out of date so you have to buy updates for it or download updates if you are using cloud-based software, it typically updates automatically because it's all um, virtually out there. How many people have had their computer crash before? 
and lost a ton of information. Yeah. So one of the options or um, advantages of having everything on the cloud is that if your computer crashes, you just buy another computer, you log in, and all the information is still there because it's all up on the cloud. And you can access data from anywhere. So, um, you know, with the online banking or, I don't have QuickBooks on my phone, but you could, you know, I'm sure there's a QuickBooks app. Pull the information up on your phone and just get the data that you need. Or some programs you can actually snap a picture of your receipt and it'll automatically upload it and stick it where it needs to go and then keep a digital copy of that receipt. It just depends on how how much you want to get into it. You could be, you know, like a Tony, or you could be like my food truck guy. And it, again, it all goes back to just being comfortable. Don't you risk um, hackers getting into your into the cloud and? Um, there's always a chance of, of your account getting hacked into. But it, I mean, I guess it depends. So is somebody going to go in and try and hack your accounting software? Probably not. What they might do is if you have customer records, hack in and collect that information. So name, address, phone number, credit card information. So. I mean, there's a lot of controversy out right now about keeping private information private. Mm -hmm. um, that's now why they have on the square, and you used to be able to just slide it. Now they've got it where you stick the chip in, so you don't technically keep that client's data. Um, it's scrambled and sent, so that data is actually not kept. When you're thinking about information that you're going to keep on the cloud, Again, they're probably not going to hack in and want to steal your information because mm -hmm. that probably is not as valuable to them. But I, I don't know. I don't know. It's kind of a tough question, and I think it's it's a little controversial. We actually, I think there might be a, a flyer inside of there. We have a cybersecurity series that we put on that talks about data and safety of your data and different things that you can use. We have a lot of clients that have gotten, I don't want to say hacked, but have made poor decisions when they're combing through their email. So click here to do this or follow this link to do that. I mean, and I send people links all the time. Here, look at this training or, you know, go here to register on our website. And it kind of is ironic because we're telling people, don't click on links that people send you, but then we're sending you links to click on. So it's kind of like a double-edged sword. It, with the convenience of everything being, I mean, <coughs> accessible like that by clicking a link, sometimes you don't know where you're being sent. So, I mean, cloud computing and, and having things virtual is the way that things are trending. I think as cybersecurity becomes more important that they're going to have more safeguards in place, so I think the data will be safer. I think it's all about your comfort level with it mm -hmm. and your need for accessibility to the information. Um, okay. So there's another component of uh, storage and that's called file hosting. So that would be um, something like a Dropbox or Google Drive, things like that. So if I have a document and I want to share it with you, instead of attaching it to an email, I could just send you a link and then you could go direct, well, <laughs> I shouldn't send you links, but I'm sending you links anyway. <laughs> but they're saying that it's more secure to send someone a link to a document than to attach the document to the email and then send them an email. Plenty of room up front here, Jeff. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, you don't have to. So John is a professor at CMU, and he just did something that his students do all the time, walking into class and trying to sit in the back of their room. <laughs> and everybody beat me too. Yeah. Welcome, yeah. welcome. We're glad you're here. Um, so you can also share really, really large files. So if you have 
a bunch of financial information and you want to send it to your accountant so he can work on your taxes. You don't necessarily have to send it as an attachment. If you have all of that information in an Excel spreadsheet or um, in a Google Drive document, you can just take all of that information, send him the link to that, he can go to that document, and then not only is your information secure, but you don't have to worry about that attachment kind of floating out there, and then he can get right into that information. Again, there's no loss of files when your computer crashes because everything is virtually, whether it be customer records, whether it would be maybe copies of sample contracts, things like that, um, accessible from anywhere. And typically it's free most of the time depending on the amount of storage that you need and the type of program that you use. So we use um, the Google programs here, so Google Drive, Google Sheets, Google Docs, and all of those are free. If you're using Dropbox, Dropbox has a certain amount of storage that you can have for free, and then you have to start paying for that. So it just kind of depends. So when we talk about business software, you have to look at the different needs that you have for your business. So lots of different options available. And it's kind of funny when they talk about business software, they talk about email, because I don't necessarily look at email as a software program, but it is a, an electronic way to, to communicate. Uh, when I think about software products, I think more about customer management systems. So tracking your customers, their information, um, their email addresses, that type of stuff so you can, can connect with them. Spreadsheets um, and accounting, thinking about that as well. So when you're thinking about the needs that you have for your business, what is it that you need to track? What kind of business software is it that you need? So say you're in the retail business. You want to be able to track your inventory, what's coming in the door, what's going out the door. That's going to help you not only track your profitability, but that's also going to help you track the actual inventory. So do you have things that are just coming up missing? You know, employees walking off with stuff, store theft, things like that. It can help you track what's selling and what's not. So if you're buying a certain item and that item is not selling, your inventory tracking system is going to let you figure that out. Um, I'm thinking about miters. So Myers knows when something is getting low on the shelf, and they have a way to get that stuff stocked back on the shelf. And they don't have someone, you know, going along looking, oh, we need ranch dressing and Cheez-Its, and everything at Myers is electronic. And if you don't have the ability to work with Myers electronically, they're not selling your product. So tracking that, that's really important. Manufacturing, thinking about how a specific piece of machinery or a specific product goes through the process. So I was talking to, I can't remember if it was one of my students or if it was one of my clients, and they have, it's, it was like a chip that was attached to this piece of, it wasn't a piece of machinery, but it was a product. And as the product goes through the production process, this chip allows them to track where this piece of machinery is in the production process. So you don't necessarily have to come down from your office and know, hey, where is this in the process? You can look on your software, ideally, and find out where that is, whether it's through a GPS program or whether it's through some type of a scanning system. So if there's a barcode on it, when it goes to this process, you scan it so you know it's through that process. When it goes through this process, maybe you scan it again. So depending on what type of need you have, if you need to track where it's at, if you need to track how many, that would work as well. So who had the e-commerce site? Who's talking about e-commerce? Okay, so thinking about the software that's gonna allow you to sell things virtually, um, you know, the cart or PayPal program, what type of software do you, what type of software do you use to track that? Um, I'm just starting to get that set up. Okay. Uh, I had set up a PayPal account today. Okay. Um, kind of getting that organized, but, uh, I'm working through a website called Shopify. Oh, yeah. Okay, I've heard of that. And uh, mm -hmm. well, organized through there. Mm -hmm. I've got some other programs to yeah. track. And just set up QuickBooks, too. Yeah, so there's a lot of different things. And, and all of the programs you ideally 
will kind of talk to each other. So if you are set up on Shopify, ideally when you sell something on Shopify, Shopify will check your inventory, make sure that that inventory is there in place. And then it will connect to PayPal and it will pull that money out of that person's account and digitally put it in your bank and then record that in your QuickBooks system. So in a perfect world, I don't know if it would actually work like that. But looking at the different types of software you have and kind of how it all works together. Um, how many users are you going to have on your system? Does everybody need to be able to access the information at the same time? Or is it only one person can go into this record and work on it at one time? Um, it just kind of depends. Um, a lot of times there's industry specialization. So again, I used to work in the insurance industry, so we had specific software that was applicable only to our industry. It couldn't really be modified to any other industry because it's, it was very unique. Um, software that's used in the medical industry. So a lot of the medical offices and hospitals are going to EMR, electronic medical records. And so their information that they're gonna track is gonna be very, very specific. So I was talking to my class last night about um, medical records. And the medical records industry is becoming very, very interesting. So with everybody kind of all being connected. So let's say I went and I had a test in Claire, at the hospital in Claire. And then I had to come down to my doctor's office in Midland. And then maybe I had to go have another test at the hospital in Midland. So all of those records would be stored in one place. So everybody could access that information. So my doctor didn't have to call up to the hospital in Claire and have them fax the test results to him. Or um, you know, the lab information would be instantaneously on my medical records. Um, I was reading an article the other day about and this kind of sounds sci-fi, but about um, embedding chips in people. So you embed chips in dogs, you know, you have your dog microchip. So now they're talking about the ability to have a chip embedded within you, so all of your information would be with you. So whether it be medical records, so you would go to the hospital, they would do all the tests, and they would download the information on your chip. So then when you went to your doctor's office, then your doctor's office could upload that information from your chip and add to it. Um, it also has you know, a GPS component to it as well, so tracking where people are, which I would like to do with my 16-year-old, but I don't know if that's the law. Right they, they've already done that in uh, Florida, mm -hmm. Florida and California. I think specialized uh, individuals mm -hmm. that have a lot of problems or something of that nature that absolutely have to have mm -hmm. that notification right, right away. Yeah. And they can't carry a book with them. Yeah. So, <laughs> I mean, there, there are a lot of, of things coming up in the future, so um, don't be surprised if you see things like that. Um, online options. So, is it important to be able to access the information online? Um, and can anybody think of any other applications, business software? I mean, I, I'm thinking about the software that we use to keep our client information. Um, the SBA uses something very similar, um, but it's bas just basic data. But the type of software that you use, it, is, it depends on what it is you need it to do. I just downloaded uh, QuickBooks Self-Employed. Oh, OK. And I'm I'm definitely the everything in the shoebox and once a month kind of guy. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> no software, right? But um, what I really like about QuickBooks Self-Employed, especially being a mobile, you know, driving around a lot, mm -hmm. is it actually I turn on mileage tracker, and it actually just yeah. every time I drive somewhere, it automatically tracks the exact miles on a map of yeah. how far I went, and then once a week it'll send me a reminder, hey, you've got like 75 trips to review mm -hmm. that I can just review. And if it was personal, you swipe one way. If it was business, you swipe the other way. So it tracks all your mileage. Yeah. And it's awesome because I'm not the kind of guy who's going to pull a book down and write my mileage in yeah. when I go somewhere. Isn't that better so, than a shoebox? Yeah, that's correct. <laughs> that's amazing. It's QuickBook self-employed, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. app right on the phone. So, you know, a lot of cool technology that's going to make your life easier, but it's only easier if you use it. So, I mean, if that works for you, that is an awesome thing, because that's gonna make your life a lot easier at the end of the year when you're trying to track your mileage and trying to expense things out. So, yeah, I didn't know that they had that. Is, is that a brand new thing? 
I have no idea. I downloaded it in November when I okay. really got up and going. Okay. Um, and I've been using it since then. Yeah. So. Interesting. That's what the only thing I really use it for is the mileage right now, but it's great for that. Yeah. Does it have a component where you can take pictures of receipts yes. on it? Yes. Okay. So, uh, I yeah. just haven't started doing it yet. Yeah. I haven't hit that time anymore. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I might add uh, appointment management or customer mm -hmm. relations management software. Oh. Yeah, definitely, definitely. So you've got this big group of people that you have, you know, emails information for, you know, how do you manage that? I mean, we sent you guys an email and reminded you to come tonight, and then we're gonna send you an email with a survey, which I really need you guys to all complete. <laughs> uh, so that's, that's definitely a, an important piece. And appointments too. I mean, we we sometimes forget. At least I do. Um, you know, we live by our calendar. I mean, I I don't do anything without kind of looking at my calendar, and making sure that you have those events on there. You know, whether it's catering event or a barbecue event, or calendar is going to be really important for you as well because you're going to want to make sure that you don't double book those rooms. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So she's um, considering starting an escape room. So John may be able to tell you how to get in touch with some CMU students. Yeah, okay. sure. Yeah. I think that's the scariest business model concept I've ever thought. Why? I would. <laughs> you're not. You're not actually locked in. I would have watched the on the outside, but <laughs> it's great. We need one in town, don't you think? I, I think so. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. why I'm, I'm excited. Yeah. yeah. Good, good, good. So you can give her some tips on how she can get in touch with the students, maybe oh, sure. a student organization yeah, or something. So. Oh, yeah. yeah. That would yeah. be fantastic. I think that, that that demographic would really like that. I'm with you. I'm like, ah, this escape room kind of freaks me out. But you're not, like, locked in. Right. It's like a mystery on kind of how to get out. But I don't know. If you go, I'll go. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so that's going to be our last night of class. We're all going to go to an escape room. But I uh, you should put one on a truck if you could have a mobile escape room. They do yeah. actually have, have those. One already? Yeah. No, but I, I was thinking about doing the um, the different festivals that uh -huh. they have in the summertime. You yeah. start them in the in the spring and then just hit the chamber of commerce in that uh -huh. respective area and then just take it mobile and do a like a sort of a instead of an hour, do it for fifteen to twenty minutes. And that way it's like a little fix they, they can go in, do a, a mini escape. Could we drop our kids off? <laughs> <laughs> as long as there's an 18 year old with them. Oh, yes. <laughs> oh darn, they're not out yet. <laughs> I don't want my kids to have the code, especially the younger one. He needs to stay in there and yeah. sit for a while. <laughs> um, so it's important when you're looking at a software to determine your particular business needs. So what is it that you're trying to do? Whether it's retail, wholesale, service, product, um, Make sure that the business software that you have matches your business type um, and size. Um, so email. So they're, they're looking at email as a business software. I guess I don't necessarily, email doesn't seem to need to be a software, but managing your email um, and your um, marketing and your social media and things like that can definitely be affected by your email. So using it to communicate with clients, using it to communicate with employees, suppliers, vendors, email is, is becoming more and more common as a, a method of communication. So how many people have a Gmail address? Yeah, so Gmail tends to be typically the standard Gmail or Outlook, I think a lot of people use that. We use Gmail here at the college. Um, that's kind of like our platform, midmish.edu, but, but Gmail is where we kind of filter everything through. And it's also, you can use your email, I'm trying to figure out how to say this. There's a couple different ways that you can use your email. So you can create like a filing system. So if you want to keep all your, um, all of your jobs for July, you could create a July folder. If you want to keep all of your jobs and your correspondence for August, you can keep an August folder. If you want to keep all of your correspondence with um, contractors, you can do that. So you can use your email to be your record keeping system. Um, 
sometimes that can get a little dangerous because you can folder yourself to death. But I, for my classes, I typically set up a folder for each class. And then when I get communication from students, I throw that in a folder. So then if I want to look and see, oh, well, this one missed class three times in a row, but she sent me an email and the other ones didn't email me at all. So keeping it in that specific bucket, if you will, um, is also a good idea. Anybody have any other ideas on how they could use email to make their business easier? I know uh, one thing I'm looking at is automatic email. Yeah. Somebody clicks on your website or whatever, mm -hmm. and they give your email. Mm -hmm. and got a series of automatic emails mm -hmm. that you don't have to even touch that automatically generates emails to customers. Yeah. Every few days to follow up with them. And you know, too, different offers to them and stuff like that. Have you seen, um, since you're doing an e commerce site, normally there's like a wall. Like if you want this specific piece of information or if you want to get onto this certain shopping site, you have to enter in your email address in order to access yeah, use the that site. To entice them to give them your email. Right. So once you get the email, then you can set up on the automatic system where they'll you know, automatically uh, contact them. Yeah, exactly. And I think that that's a very effective tool, especially in the e-commerce situation. I'm trying to think of the website. It was a furniture store that I was trying to get on. I want to say it was like Lola and Sons or something like that. And it would not let me in until I gave them my email. And I really wanted to look at I think it was a table or something. And it was really starting to piss me off because I could not get in there without <laughs> giving them my email. So finally I gave them my email and I looked at the table and it was like $600. I'm like, there's no way I'm gonna buy this table. Now they email me constantly. And I can't unsubscribe. Why? I, it won't let me unsubscribe. I keep clicking unsubscribe and it won't stop sending me emails. I always so put fake emails on those ones. Just I, I thought about that, but what if they send me a discount coupon? <laughs> <laughs> there are some that will make you verify your email, though, and then yeah. I just don't worry about it. But. Yeah, so I don't know. I don't know. But, and two, thinking about um, setting it up so there's like a paywall or something. So if you are getting into a business where you're doing blogging or you have um, inspirational self-help articles or something, so 10 ways to make your life better. So maybe you could go in and you could view like the first two, but if you want to see the other 10, then you have to pay 99 cents or whatever. So kind of like a tickler thing to kind of get you enticed in, but if you want the beef of the stuff, then you gotta well, we get the pay price. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good main product. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean there's lots of different different options available. Um, so spreadsheets. Who loves spreadsheets? Yeah. They uh, can be your best friend or your worst enemy. So I have worked on a spreadsheet and had the wrong formula in there. I had a client who sent me some spreadsheets the other day and I was looking at the numbers and the numbers just weren't matching. Well, the totals that she was capturing were only for half of the column. She was capturing Oops. the whole column for the revenue information, only half of the column for the expense information. So it looked like she was very profitable and she couldn't figure out why she was losing money because your formulas suck. And that's sometimes why you should not use spreadsheets. Um, but I have clients that are just um, wizards, I guess you could call them, and just amazing at spreadsheets. So spreadsheets are a great way to track information. So clients, you can track inventory, you can track sales, you can do employee timesheets. There's a lot of different things that you can do with that. Um, you can sort, um, pivot tables, all kinds of different things. Once you get in there and start playing with spreadsheets, it's an amazing thing. But you have to um, be very cognizant of where your formulas are and that all of your calculations are happening correctly. I just do basic formulas. I'm not like a wizard or anything, but you can make spreadsheets that can do amazing things. And we actually have a financial projections spreadsheet that I can send it to you guys if you want to look at it. It'll blow your mind. It's really cool. But you can use it for what if scenarios. So when you're thinking about putting your business plan together and looking at financial projections, you can put the information in the spreadsheet and, okay, if my expenses are this and my revenue is this and I have this many employees, what does it look like for my bottom line? 
okay, now what if I change this and what if I change this? How does that work? So spreadsheets are a great thing that you can use that for. We also have a program that we use called Live Plan, which kind of does the same thing, but it's not in the spreadsheet format, but it allows you to do calculations and what-if scenarios. So there's a lot of different options out there. Um, and there's you know Excel, you can use Excel. Um, there's Google Sheets. There is, there's another open source software but I can't think of what it is that does sheets. Um, but Excel sheets are totally fine to track everything. You know, customers, emails, revenues, expenses. Absolutely, absolutely works great. Just watch the formulas. Um, so accounting, that is one of the areas that I would say 99% of my clients struggle is in tracking the financial information. And, um, it, it can sometimes be frustrating when you're trying to determine the profitability of your business and you don't have the ability to look at all of your information in one spot. So using accounting software helps you track information such as sales, expenses, inventory, assets. One of the things that that is really important for is not only tracking your financial um, snapshot, but also for tracking seasonality of your business. So if you know that you have a lot of jobs in the summer, but you don't necessarily have any in the winter, how do you plan for that? Um, cash flow, I think they talked about cash flow last week. And if you're keeping all of your information instead of in a spreadsheet in an accounting software program, you're gonna have a lot less errors. You're gonna be able to run a lot better reports faster. It's really not that expensive. Um, how much do you pay a month for that? I think it's like four ninety nine. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. So very, very reasonable. And it, in in the case of a small business owner, that's really probably all you need. You don't need to pay the you know hundred dollars a month or you know whatever it is. If that works for you, you know absolutely that's going to be a great, great thing. And it's going to allow you to be better organized. Do you feel more organized now? With my mileage, yeah, yeah, <laughs> and I and I do plan on implementing more of it. And mm -hmm. between that and Square, I think I'll be able to capture pretty much everything, mm -hmm. um, and lose kind of the paper trail like we were talking about. Yeah. But um, I just gotta take the time to do it. Yeah. Well, I mean, the, the, and the paper's not necessarily a bad thing. I mean, keeping right. records is keeping records. You have to do what's going to be best for you. It's going to be easier to track and calculate if you do it electronically. But keeping it in, you know, an envelope or a folder, you know, by job or by day or by week is better than nothing. It's better than the shoebox. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I have not had a client come in to me with a shoebox yet. So I'm very thankful for that. I've, I've had a shoebox of folders, but I've never had the actual shoebox. Yes, I don't even have a shoebox. I have a dresser drawer. Oh, no. <laughs> don't bring me your dresser but drawer. But I won't bring that to you. <laughs> <laughs> so everybody has their own way of, of keeping, keeping track of things. But the idea is to um, just be better organized so you can have a better snapshot of your business. So I guess the most important thing to think about is when you're thinking about your accounting system, um, how could you improve it? How could you make it work better for you? How can you be more efficient? Um, you know, you're using it now to track your mileage and that's great because mileage is really a pain to track. But if you have the ability to you know, snap the receipts and put all that information in there, that's great too. If you have the ability to you know, download information from your bank on you know, deposits and things like it, that. It does that also. Mm -hmm. link, I linked my business bank account to it and every time something happens with that account, mm -hmm. if it's a purchase or whatever, it'll show up on there and ask me, was this personal, was it yeah. a business expense? So it does track that part also. Yeah. So that's gonna be a nice feature for you to use and I think you'll find it even more beneficial when you go to the end of the year and are trying to figure out you know, your tax situation and, and profitability too. If you can't measure it, it's hard to track. Any questions specifically about accounting systems? So is accounting software different or similar to tax 
software. I think it's different. It's different. Um, okay. I think accounting software would be where you are tracking your information, um, whether it be for um, profitability, seasonality, um, things like that. I think the tax software is more on. Um, I mean, I say the accountant side because you're figuring out um, not necessarily how profitable you were, but how much money you have to pay in. Mm -hmm. And two, when you're thinking um, the tax component of it, then you're adding in things like depreciation, mm -hmm. which is not necessarily a cash transaction, but is you know a lowering mm -hmm. of your um, tax ramifications. So, um, and you guys will learn all about that in the last week, and I am not teaching that one because I'm not the tax person. But you want your accounting system to talk to your tax system. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely, yeah. So ideally, you want to be able to send your information to your accountant virtually. I mean, mm -hmm. you don't want to take your computer in there and, you know, onesie, twosie, if they can talk to each other. Even if it's just where you would um, spit out a report in an Excel spreadsheet that they can then upload to their system. There's a lot of different programs that talk to each other. Um, like we have a Profit Sense program, and Profit Sense, you can actually look at a tax return and pull, I don't know if it goes virtually, but you can pull specific information from the tax return and plug it into the Profit Sense program and do calculations on that. Um, we have a program that we use for financial projections called Live Plan, and Live Plan will upload the information from your financial software and do different calculations on it. So it's all about an upload, download kind of output thing. Okay, so if you don't know how to use the software or want to experiment with the software, um, just go out there and, and see if there's a free trial. So a lot of times you can go in and you could just kind of test it out and see if you like it before you actually have to pay for it. Um, YouTube is a wonderful thing if you want to learn how to do or how an actual software works. You can always go on YouTube and kind of look at it. There's also all different kinds of training webinars. So I had to do something the other day. I can't even remember what program it was. Um, but instead of getting on a webinar and having someone show me how to do it, they sent me a link to a YouTube video and said, here, this is how you do it. So I wasn't very happy about that because I kind of wanted my hand held because I don't like watching the YouTube video. <laughs> but um, you know, there's a lot of different resources out there. We have a lot of different webinars and stuff, not necessarily on um, accounting stuff because we usually kind of rely on our banking partners or Sometimes the libraries have programs that they, um, like Excel training and things like that. We do offer Excel classes here in you know a long-term and a short-term kind of format. So if that is something that you're interested in. A lot of times you can talk to your accountant or your bookkeeper, and what they can do is they can kind of give you a crash course. So were you guys here when Jan Garver was here? Jan is amazing. So Jan will, I'm not gonna say she'll hold your hand, but Jan will explain it to you in a way that you can understand it and it makes sense. And she probably told you this, but it is gonna be a lot less expensive for you on the front end to work with an accountant to get your accounting software set up correctly than it is to have to go back to your accountant and pay them to fix something that you have done incorrectly. So, um, that's just something important to kind of think about. You might not want to put a lot of money out on the front end, but it's going to save you money on, on the back end. Oh, so I guess the big takeaway from this is when you're thinking about how you're going to track your records and your record keeping, you can talk about it all day long, but you've got to start it right now. You don't want to delay it. You want to make sure that, you know, whether it's a folder or whether it's your phone or whatever it is, that you start it from day one because it's going to be a lot easier if you do it right away than going through the dresser drawer and trying to figure out what went where and put it in an envelope. But you're saving your receipts, so that's a good thing. Yeah. And you kind of have an, an order to it, but there's probably room for improvement on any system that you have. It just depends on, on your comfort level with it and, and what, what's gonna work best for you. 
Um, so does anybody have any specific questions on, on anything? So record keeping is kind of, it's kind of a generic topic, but it's really, really important if you want to talk about specific record keeping for your business or specific programs that might work for you, there's all different kinds of things that we can talk about and experiment with and you know things that we've used in the past. So, I mean, I think everybody's probably got my card, but if you want to send me an email, hey, this is the kind of business I have, I'm looking for some software to do this, or I'm looking for an Excel spreadsheet to do this, um, you know, there's all kinds of different opportunities and options available. And we actually have, I'm trying to think of the client that I had. It was a sand and gravel company, and they were trying to figure out doing projections on, I can't remember what it was, but we have a guy, his name is Chris Kleewanite, uh, up on our main campus, and he is the Excel wizard. So I met with him one day and I said, I want an Excel spreadsheet that does this and this and this. And he was like, boom, 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 he can put it together. Mm -hmm. So if you have a specific application that you're trying to do an Excel spreadsheet for, um, we have a wizard on campus and I have access to him. So, you know, think about that. Does anybody have any specific questions? Yeah, Ted. So um, after this year is done, mm -hmm. we're about to finish 2017. Uh -huh. Um, we'll put all of the records for 2017, you know, once we do the taxes and everything, mm -hmm. to bed and store them. Mm -hmm. So, talk to us a little bit about your recommendations for uh, storing records, mm -hmm. archiving records. I know, you know, um, mm -hmm. it used to be fairly easy in the old paper days, mm -hmm. right? But now it's kind of befuddling yeah. to me. Yeah. I mean, it depends on the type of information you know that that you have mm -hmm. and the method that you're using to store it. I mean, is it important to keep you know every gas receipt and every food receipt? And it depends. I mean, the IRS may go back seven years to see if you paid eight dollars for that piece of meat or if you paid eighty cents. If you're trying to, you know, I mean, I think you have to be realistic about what you're going to save and how long you're going to save it for. If you have everything electronic, I mean, I don't know, does, is an electronic copy of the receipt good enough for an IRS audit? I mean, I don't. If it's scanned, it's probably hard. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I'm not too sure. That would probably be a question um, when we have our tax person in on what the approved, um, you know, document format storage guidelines are. I mean, I, I feel personally that a digital record is the same as a paper record. So you could scan everything in and then eliminate the paper documents. But I wouldn't take my word for it if you're sitting in front of an IRS agent and he says he wants the originals. Mm -hmm. So here on campus, anytime I am submitting for reimbursement for mileage or expenses or anything, I have to send a scanned copy of all my receipts but then I have to send all of my original receipts to the business office and they keep all of those. So the record keeping guidelines could be different if you're a government organization. We must have to keep original documents. Or if you're doing work with the government, maybe there's a different you know, record keeping guideline. I don't, I don't know specifically what format is acceptable as far as a storage mechanism, as far as IRS guidance. And that's kind of what it's what it's all about. I mean, if you're thinking, if you have paper, I mean, I'm not. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I don't know. It's certainly tax returns. And mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, and I think there was a. Um, I think that there was a slide, and it talked about um, you know payroll needs to be cut for a certain amount of time. Um, mm -hmm. Receipts need to be cut for a certain amount of time. Any type of retirement information, financial information, that needs to be, um, you know, cut perpetually. You don't typically don't get rid of that. Um, but it all boils down to what, what is acceptable according to the IRS, because that's kind of like, that's the governing body that's going to come back and ask for the information you want to have in the format that they are requesting it. Did you have a question? Yes, could you elaborate a little bit more on the score? 
Page oh yeah, so SCORE is an organization. Um, they operate like the SBDC. They're they're an SBA funded program, and it, what it is is it's a group of. It used to be the acronym for. Um, I can't even remember, but basically it is um, executives, business executives that are. Um, typically not actively in business anymore, and they serve as mentors to business owners. So there's a variety of SCORE chapters throughout the state of Michigan. We don't really have anyone in this particular area that is really active, although there has been a lot of conversation recently about um, the SCORE chapters and the SBDC working better together. We're not on opposing teams. We both do the same thing just differently. So um, typically the SCORE members are volunteers. Mm -hmm. So if you are um, looking to get into retail operation, ideally they would connect you with someone who has worked in an executive level in a retail operation so they can provide feedback and mentorship for you. Um, with the SBDC, we are, we're paid for what we do, so we're here 40 hours a week and, um, you know, are as accessible as you need us to be. It's just, it's a different, um, different type of service and different skill set, but basically housed under the SBA program. Okay. Yeah, have you worked with a SCORE member before? I haven't. I was just reading this and it just intrigued me and I was mm -hmm. wondering if we did have any yeah. local, what she said we don't. I mean, I, and not to say that we're not going to have any in the future. I know that that is one of the initiatives going forward. I mean, speaking as recently as two weeks ago, um, our uh, state director, Keith Brophy, has been talking with the state director of SCORE to figure out how we can work better together. Um, some areas have really active SCORE chapters. So um, in southwest Michigan, they're very, very active. In the Detroit area, they're very active. Um, it, it just depends. But if it's something you know that, that you would like some feedback in or are interested in, I can definitely reach out and see, you know, who we have in the area that's that's available. We just don't right now have a really strong score chapter here in the Mid Michigan area, but it could be coming soon. <laughs> at, at what point should we get with a bookkeeper? When we, at what point when we're starting a business? Should we sit down with them and, and go over everything? Um, I would say sooner as opposed to later. Because you want to make sure that that you start your record keeping off on the right foot right in the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, if you're planning on starting business in a year, you probably don't need to get with them right now. But if you're planning on starting your business in the next, say, two to three months, mm -hmm. then you probably want to make an appointment with someone that from an accounting firm and um, I if you send me an email I'll send you a link <coughs> to a, um, but don't click on the link <laughs> I will send you a document it's it's what to look for in an accounting firm okay. so accounting firms are different and they have different specialties and different strategies so you may just want an accounting firm that just um, files your taxes pays your payroll and does your taxes at the end of or you may want an accounting firm that is a little bit more strategic and can help you um, develop some strategy related to your financials. Mm -hmm. So there's, um, it's like a little one page sheet of, of what to look for in an accounting firm. And it's not necessarily, you know, a quiz. Do you do this? Do you do this? Do you do this? It kind of gives you a better idea of what capabilities an accounting firm has, mm -hmm. and then you can decide what's important to you. Okay. And then when you're talking to that accounting firm, you can say, you know, I'm interested in this. Do you provide this service? Okay. Um, there's some really good accounting firms downtown. Jan Garber, um, you know, does a really good job. Mm -hmm. Depending on how much stuff they do for you, I mean, it can be as inexpensive as say fifty dollars a month for them to you know, file your quarterly taxes okay. or do your payroll. It just, it just depends on the amount that they're going to be involved. Okay. They may just be able to tell you what you need to do mm -hmm. and then you could just send them the information. It, it, you, they might not need to be as involved. It just depends on your comfort level with right. the accounting. Some people are really comfortable. Some people are just mm -hmm. not happening. Okay. Thank you. 
understand. Anybody else? Okay, well, that was record keeping in a nutshell. If you have any specific questions on software related to your business or um, want me to do some research on, you know, maybe different programs that might be available, um, you know, I can, I can do some specific digging. Did you have a question? Afterwards. Okay. <laughs>